All right, hybrid conferences. Okay, great. Um, so welcome to my session about serverless microservices with Azure Container Apps. So my name is Jakob Ian. Uh, I also work at Active Solution, uh, based here in Stockholm. So we work mainly with customers trying to help them build solutions either on Azure or moving towards Azure. Uh, so it's a lot of past services, some hybrid solutions, and also some on-prem solutions. Uh, I used to be a DevOps MVP. Uh, now I'm an Azure MVP. Uh, I have written some books in the DevOps space, which didn't make me rich at all. And I usually say that if you write a book, and you should because it's a, it's a fun, it's a, it's a great learning experience actually. Uh, but if you do, you should never include a year in the title, right? Uh, because it's everybody feels like the next year it's immediately it's, it's out of date, right? I mean, it's 2016 now. Why would I you know buy a book that's called 2015? So that's my my tip of advice for you if you want to go into that one. Um, so. Uh, Container, container apps, uh, and I think uh, it's about microservices, and uh, you know some of us build microservices, some of us, some of us don't. Uh, but in general, uh, microservice architectures and containers, right, are a very good fit because microservices is about breaking things apart into smaller pieces, uh, and also being able to kind of pick the technology that you want for each of these services. So you no longer have to have like this monolithic architecture with the same framework, the same technology, and so on. You break them apart, uh, select the, uh, the tech stack, uh, the storage you want for that particular microservices, which is really nice. Uh, but then when you come to building and packaging and deploying this stuff, that's when the problem starts, because now it's a very uh, wide range of technology choices that you suddenly need to kind of install and support. And that's where containers is really nice, because once you package this into containers, it doesn't really matter what's inside that container, right? It could be a .NET app, it could be a Java app, uh, and so on. So containers is a really good fit for microservices. Uh, so I want to talk about more about microservices. Uh, and you can definitely use container apps without having a, a microservice architecture, and so on. Uh, but if you're talking about running an application that is built on multiple containers, right? Uh, a microservice architecture, that's, that's not, that it's not just one web application, right? You typically have uh, multiple parts of this solution. You could have backend APIs, you can have backend processes, and so on. So if we do want to run a multi-container application, what do we need? What kind of features would we need from such a service? So first up, it's the topic of service discovery. So you know, when you start spreading out these services across multiple machines, multiple hosting services, you need a way to being able to easily find that service to actually be able to communicate with it, right? Uh, and that can be a pretty complex problem uh, sometimes. Uh, preferably, it should be the same when you run it locally. Uh, find an easy way to actually talk between these services. Also include things like load balancing. Uh, so if I want to scale out, uh, have multiple instances. I want to be, have kind of automatic load balancing between this, these services. Uh, also, we want to be able to have zero downtime deployments. Uh, Magnus talked a little bit about deployments. And uh, if again, if you break out in multiple pieces here, you want to be able to upgrade parts of your system, right? The service that you changed, should, you should be able to deploy that. But you want to do that in a safe way without actually causing downtime for, you, for your entire system. So having a way to do zero downtime deployments is really important. Uh, next up, we have scaling. Um, so you want to be able to auto scale your application, uh, either based on, on metrics such as uh, CPU memory, like, like if your application actually creates a lot of load on the system, you want to be able to scale out. Uh, but it could also be for like event-based scaling. For example, if you have a high number of messages on your service bus, you want to be able to scale out uh, the things that actually consume those messages. So if you have, as in my demo later, I have a, an order processor. So if I send a lot of orders to my queue, I want actually to scale out the number of order, order processors so I can consume and process those messages faster. Also, in a distributed system, uh, a lot of things actually become more complex compared to if you have like this monolithic system. And one of those things uh, is, is monitoring and tracing because you used to have like a, the application was pretty much running on one box and everything was written to the same place. So it was quite easy to, to look at the logs and try and figure out what, what actually happened. Now, if you break it apart uh, and you know, having all these different services, it can actually be quite complex to, to get an overview and to, to look for the, for the root cause. If you, you enable, or if you find yourself having some kind of production bugs, 
you have to kind of be able to trace back uh, maybe to the original request and you need to follow along what actually happened. So having monitoring and distributed tracing built in, in into such a service uh, is also crucial actually. Uh, wow. No problem. I like to hear myself talk. Not. <laughs> Uh, and the two last uh, bullets here is, uh, is maybe like uh, one of the, the, the crucial things here. You don't want to care about the infrastructure, right? You just want to focus on the application you're building. Wouldn't that be super nice? Just deploy it to the cloud and let someone else you know, worry about the infrastructure. And in addition to that, it would be really nice if you just you know, pay for what we're actually using. So several of the offerings that you can you know, deploy applications to, such as, for example, virtual machines or Kubernetes clusters, those are, you know, th those are running all the time, even if you're not actually running anything on them, right? If you provision a Kubernetes cluster, those machines will be running. Uh, you know, and if your application is idle, doesn't process any requests, those machines will still cost you money, right? And you can scale those down and up and so on, but it's hard to kind of be really efficient there. So. The end goal here is to you know pay for what you're actually using, and if your application isn't running, you shouldn't really have to pay for it. So looking at the containers in Azure, what are your options? So uh, the most simple one is probably the Azure Container Instances. How many have used those? Not that many. So this is basically you have a containerized application and that typically performs some task. It could be like a short running task, for example. You can just say run this container in the cloud somewhere. So this is actually kind of a serverless thing, but it's mainly targeted towards kind of simple scenarios, not, not long running things, not complex applications, but for short running tasks, uh, this is a great option. Uh, so so that, that's the simplest option. Uh, but again, it's not really designed for building, you know, multi-container apps. So next up, if you're, you're building a web application, you typically are, are using probably Azure App Service, which is a great offering for, for uh, you know, hosting web application. Um, and uh, one of those options there is to, to, you know, run your application as a container. You can still use container technology, but you can deploy it into an, an Azure App Service. So it's great for, for, uh, for web apps. Uh, next one up is then the Azure Kubernetes service. How many are using Kubernetes here? So a few more of you. Um, so now you're talking about typically more complex application than, than you know, just a web application. So here you would typically have multiple parts, including APIs, including background workers, uh, order processors, those kind of things. Uh, and Kubernetes is a great platform. It's really, I mean, it's, it's really, really powerful, but with that uh, you know, power comes complexity. Um, and this has been a, like a long running discussion in, in the, the business that should really have to learn all these things, like we as developers uh, mainly, should we have to learn all these details about Kubernetes just to be able to you know, deploy multi-container applications? Um, a lot of companies are struggling with this and a lot of them uh, actually come through and they actually have this platform now and it works great, but it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of effort. Um, so we still want kind of the power of Kubernetes and the flexibility that it gives us, but we want to have something maybe on top of it, right? That they can use the power, but make it easier for us to actually deploy things on top of this. And this is actually exactly what Azure Container Apps is. Uh, this is built on top of Kubernetes, uh, but it tries to abstract away kind of most of the complex things. So as you will see, if you know Kubernetes, some of the things that can, will shine through, so some of the, like, the, the concepts will actually shine through uh, if you look at how things are named and so on. Uh, but it's a lot simpler, uh, and you don't really have to care about the cluster. You actually don't see it at all. Uh, you don't have access to it. Uh, you can just focus on deploying your application on top of that cluster. So, uh, so kind of the, the, the tagline then for container apps is you know serverless containers for for microservices. Although it doesn't have to be microservices, but the general idea is that you you you, you can build modern apps on open source, which means that they are using various open source frameworks uh, as part of this service. So I've listed a few of them uh, down here. Uh, obviously, the first one is, is uh, Kubernetes. Uh, so again, when you deploy a container app, it actually is deployed to a Kubernetes cluster somewhere in the cloud that Microsoft will host for you. You don't see it, you don't have access to it. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, they use uh, various open source projects for uh, different types of, of features uh, and so on. So for example, it uses uh, Keda, which is about uh, event-driven scaling. So we'll talk about that later. It uses Dapper, 
Um, and there's a session tomorrow by Alex. Uh, he will go more into Dapper. So I'll just mention it briefly here because there is an integration with container apps and Dapper. Uh, but Dapper is, is really a way to, to speed up your productivity when it comes to building microservice applications. And also it uses Envoy, which is a, a traffic proxy. So it like handles your, your traffic. But this is things that you don't really see. Uh, but it's good to know that it is actually is there and it's built it's built on top of this open source framework, which is a really nice thing actually. Instead of building, you know, their own thing, uh, they can actually leverage on this and actually, you know, uh, take part of any advances and new features that comes along here. And again, it's a language and framework agnostic because this is containers, of course. So you can use any technology that, that you want. Uh, and you're you're paying for what you're using here. So some of the examples, this is just a screenshot from the documentation. Uh, you know, what can I use container apps for? So you can you can build your APIs using container apps. Um, and it has support for traffic splitting. And I will show that later, which means that you can do, you know, blue-green deployments. You can do like uh, staging slots and those kind of things. Uh, and you can scale these uh, APIs based on the number of requests in a real simple way. So. Start low, you can even start on zero instances, and then you can scale up automatically when you start getting requests. Uh, another option is uh, you know, background processing, things that actually consume CPU and memory, and then you can scale based on that CPU. This could be like background cal calculation, image processing, those kind of things. Uh, Event-driven processing, of course, uh, things that actually read messages from a queue, for example, and then you would use metrics from that queue to actually scale out. So there's various ways to scale out here. And of course, kind of this sums up then to, to you know, building microservices. Um, and then the fact that it actually kind of enables you to use Dapper if you want to, will make, make it a bit easier for you to actually build those microservices. Um, but again, I mean, you can, you can really run, run anything, but this is like typical scenarios uh, for your container apps. But again, if you have like, if you have, for example, just building one web application, it doesn't make like a lot of sense to use it. Then you have already have Azure App Service, uh, but typically you have more parts, uh, and then this can actually make a lot of sense. So, okay, creating these container apps is uh, super simple. So this is an example from the CLI. Uh, if you're using that, you can use the portal, you can use the CLI, and you can use uh, ARM or, or BICEP uh, that I will show you later. Uh, but there's really just two things that you need to create when creating a uh, container app. So first off, you create the environment. Um, so an environment here is, is uh, well, if you know Kubernetes, this will actually be a namespace in a cluster somewhere. But you can think of it like uh, this is something that, that will contain your apps. Uh, and connected to the environment, you have things like uh, log analytics. So all the metrics will go to a workspace there and so on. So you create an environment. And in that environment, you can then deploy multiple container apps. Uh, which is the second part here. So you just uh, give it a name, you point it to an image, you specify the ports, you specify if you want uh, internal or public access, uh, and so on. Same thing, uh, but with uh, an ARM, in this case, a bicep file. You do the same thing. Uh, usually it's uh, you know, more idempotent to use uh, you know, a bicep file, so I typically prefer that. Uh, you know, if you run this from a, a pipeline, I typically use uh, a bicep for this. Um, but you know, it, it's the, the same thing, you just uh, represent it in a different way. I mean, have you used a uh, bicep, by the way? Okay, nice. And arm, same people? Actually, more people. Okay, so those of you who didn't use uh, bicep, immediately go to bicep uh, and, and leave arm behind. Um, and the tooling will actually help you to, you know, to, to move from arm to bicep. Okay, so let's just... Uh, uh, flip to a demo to actually create one of these uh, container apps. And uh, so I'm going to create it from the CLI, but let's just uh, start in the portal. So I already have uh, two of these uh, environments. So the container app and the container app demo. And the container app demo, which I already pre-created, is, uh, is empty. It doesn't contain. So if I go in here and I look at my apps, uh, there's no container apps. As well. So this is now like an, an empty environment. And there's something that you will configure on the environment level. For example, uh, logging, uh, as I mentioned. So it's now connected to, uh, to uh, Log Analytics workspace. So all the metrics, all the logs from my application will automatically go into that Log Analytics workspace. And I can you know, build graphs and, and alerts and queries and so on. 
but there's nothing here. So uh, let's uh, go to the CLI. So I could create it from the, the portal as well. Uh, but you know, who wants to work in the portal, right? So uh, let's just uh, use the CLI. So I, if you have the Azure CLI, you can do AC container app and then the, the, the various commands. So I can actually do a list here. Can you see back there? It's kind of small, I guess. Let's zoom in a bit. That's good. Yeah. So actually, I have uh, three uh, three container apps. I will come back to this. That's my kind of second demo. So I already have three container apps in another environment. Uh, but let's get back to that later. And let's create a container app. So we do container app create. And I just uh, prepared that one. So I'm going to create one called container app demo uh, in my existing environment. And I'm just going to point to a, a sample image from uh, Microsoft. Uh, let's just run this one. And uh, so I can zoom in a bit, little bit like this and hope that we don't lose the stream here later on. Uh, so, so the options here are, uh, again, I'm pointing to the image. That's a, a container image in the Microsoft public uh, container registry. Uh, I specify the ingress. So ingress is uh, how the traffic will be routed uh, to my container. And I'm specifying external here. So that means that I want to be able to actually reach this container from the outside world. So the other option will be internal, which will be for all the things running in my environment that doesn't require public access. So it could be like internal APIs, it could be backend processing, those kind of things. They would typically have uh, internal here. So it's uh, it's done. Uh, and uh, the last part of my, my command was actually a query. So I actually can query the result of the operation to get the, the public URL to my container app. So you can see this long, nice URL here. And it will end on like region.azurecontainerapp.io. Uh, before that, we have the actually a name that is kind of generated for the environment. Uh, of course, you can then you know use your own domain and so on. But these are the auto-generated names. So you get kind of a weird name here, proud sky dash and then some number. And then you have the, the application uh, first here. So let's just see that it works uh, and it works. So welcome to Azure Container Apps. So again, that that's like the super simple demo to to kind of show how how you actually create a, a container app. And let's go back to the portal and uh, just see what we actually got. So now we have an application here. Let's zoom in a little bit more. Um, and so now I'm inside the, the actual container app, and there's a lot of things that you can kind of enable and configure from here. Everything, of course, you can do from CLI and, and Bicep as well. Um, so let's just look at a few things. So first up, we have the, the ingress here. Um, and here you can kind of see various options. So now I'm accepting traffic from anywhere. But I could change this to internal then, which means that, again, it's just uh, accessing from within the cluster. Um, and then we can configure ports uh, and so on. So it supports HTTP and, and TCP. Um, and uh, so, so one of the nice things then is uh, Automatically support like TLS, and then you can upload your own certificate and so on. So you know, if you're used to like use, running things in Kubernetes, you kind of have to install these things yourself. You have to configure a, a cluster issuer and connect it to something. That's kind of a lot of work for something that should just be like provided by the service, right? And that's the case here. You don't really have to do anything extra uh, to get to, to get the, a proper uh, SSL connection. Uh, and then you can see, for example, we have the Dapper. Um, so, which I don't, I'm not using Dapper here, and we'll come back to that one. But again, Dapper is a, a way to build these microservices in the first place and make that a lot easier. Uh, so, I can kind of enable Dapper, which will then install some things that will be required. Again, just to make it easier for you to, to use it um, and, and, and you know, build those microservices. So, looking at the containers, uh, we'll just see the information that, that I just basically provided here. Uh, the name to my container, the image, and so on. Um, and uh, uh, one thing that is called uh, this uh, revision management. So I will actually swap to back to the slides to kind of explain this this various concept now because now it's kind of now it gets interesting, right? Uh, now we deploy the container, we can access it. That's fine. So let's talk about kind of the the, uh, the various concepts here. So we talked about the environment already. And uh, then you can install an app that we just did. And uh, 
now I just have had one instance of my application. But I could scale it out, um, so I can have multiple containers, and then, then it's uh, internally it's stored in something called a replica. That's a Kubernetes concept. You don't have to you really care about it, but that's the thing that will actually uh, make sure that your container is up and running uh, with the number of instances that you want. So if I say I want to have five instances, that replica will make sure that you have it. And if one of your instances die for some reason, you have an unheld exception, it will automatically restart to make sure that you always have you know, the desired amount of replicas there. But when I do deploy uh, an application, it's, um, we will all, always get a new uh, revision. Um, so revision, you can think of revision really as a, a particular version of your application. So now when I deployed that container app, I got automatically one revision and I can access it from the outside world and so on. But if I would now deploy a new version of my application, it will actually now create a new revision uh, for that application. Um, and then it's kind of up to you how you want to use this. You can use revisions for many things, uh, but the important thing now is this is actually what provides this uh, zero downtime deployment because it doesn't just tear down my container and deploys a new one. It actually deploys a new one in separate. And when it's up and running, the traffic will be routed to the new one. And then it will uh, remove the old one. And that's how you get zero downtime. But you can do more, many more things with this one. Uh, but let's just continue. You can then have multiple apps in the same environment, which makes a lot of sense uh, when if those apps actually talk to each other as kind of a Microsoft application. So then you will deploy multiple apps here. And in addition in, uh, to this environment is you can connect this to a virtual network. So by default, when I just create an environment, I will get the virtual network, uh, but I, don't, uh, I won't really see it. It's, it's managed by Microsoft completely. So you don't really have an access to it. But you can, of course, provide your own virtual network, uh, which is, would be the case for most of your production scenarios. You already have a virtual network, and then you can deploy container apps or the environment into that network. And in addition, you have the, the workspace uh, for the metrics and logs and so on. So this is kind of the, 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 the most core concepts uh, of uh, container apps. And again, just to, to you know, explain the concept of the revision. So when you do deploy the first time, you get uh, the first revision, which is then automatically active, which means that it's available, you can access it, uh, and so on. It will process requests. Now, if you de deploy a new version, it will deploy the revision 2, as I mentioned before. Uh, and when that is up and running, uh, the traffic will be switched to it, and then the first revision will be marked as inactive. Uh, so it's kind of deactivated. And then you can configure, for example, how many of these deactivated or inactive revisions you want to keep. Because, for example, you could uh, actually, for example, you could have multiple things inact uh, active to, to split uh, traffic to it. You can also keep uh, the, the inactive ones to go back in case of a rollback. Uh, but again, this is this is really about making sure that you have zero downtime deployments, um, and that you can do things like, for example, comparing to deployment slots in Azure App Service. You can have multiple of these things, and you can route traffic to it. I think I have an example of that uh, on the next slide. So when you create a revision, uh, it will append that revision uh, like a, a suffix. So it, by default, it will generate some some number, which means you can access that particular revision using this this URL. But you can also provide your own uh, suffix here. So if you want to call that thing uh, staging or something, you can do that. But it needs to be something unique. So some people use like the, the commit ID or, or just something that you can trace back. Um, so some of the th uh, deployments that you make will create a new revision. For example, typically, if I deploy a new version of my container, uh, that will create uh, a new revision. If I change the scale rules, we'll talk about that later, that will also create a new revision. But some changes won't uh, you know, deploy a new version for me or create a revision. For example, if I change one of the secret values uh, or if I change how traffic is flowing, those changes will not create a new revision, right? Because that's, I don't want to have a new version just because I changed how traffic is routed. So some things are application scope uh, and some changes are revision scopes. And it kind of makes sense once you get into this. If I deploy a new version, obviously it will be a new revision and so on. Uh, but again, if you work with containers, you know that containers are, you know, they're immutable. You never change them. You always deploy a new version next to the old one, and then you tear down the old one. So, for example, if you want to do traffic splitting, for example, doing things like canary deployment, uh, you can have then two revisions. They are both active, uh, and then you can 
specify, for example, like this, how much traffic should be sent to the various revisions. Um, so now you can build your new version. You can roll out it in production, but maybe just route 10% of the traffic to it. And then you can leave it like that for a while, you know, monitoring that everything looks good. If it doesn't look good, you can roll back to the previous revision. But if it do looks good, you can kind of increase these numbers uh, through a pipeline or you know, manually. And then eventually, you will route all the traffic to the latest version. Uh, yeah, this is the, the well, actually, it's, uh, yeah, I think it's arm uh, or, or, or bicep. But you can do the same thing from uh, the CLI uh, or manually in the, in the portal. So you know, typically, you will have a pipeline that kind of steps through this process of gradually rolling out the new version. So uh, let's uh, look at, if we go back to the portal, uh, this is the revision uh, management uh, page for the My Container app. And as you can see, there's only one revision here, which will then, uh, let's try to zoom in here. Uh, so there's one revision, and you can see to the right here that it's active and it's 100% traffic to it. I only have one revision, so it kind of makes sense. And uh, so now I, I don't really have a new version for this. This is the, the, the you know the Microsoft uh, demo thing. Uh, but I could do another change that actually will trigger a new revision. So I could actually, if I go to the scale, um, we can see that uh, if we can edit here. Uh, so now you know, I can actually do this kind of edits right in the portal, which is kind of strange to me, but uh, it's nice for demos. Uh, so you know, by default, uh, I'm changing the scale here from, uh, let's uh, say that I want to have a minimum of three instances and maybe a maximum of, you know, I don't know, five or six. Um, so this is like kind of manually triggering it. And then we're going to later look at the, the automatic scale rules. So. When I do this, it actually says now create and deploy new revision uh, because this is a revision scope change. So I'm going to create this one. So now it says deploying a new revision for your app. Again, you can think of revision as a version, basically. I, I didn't actually change the version of the application, but I changed something that is uh, kind of core, uh, which is how the application actually scales. And that's why it now deploys a new version. So if you go back to revision management, uh, you can actually see now that we have two revisions, uh, and now all the traffic is being sent to, to the latest one, but the, the old one is still uh, still here, and it's actually still active. Uh, and now I can kind of decide how I want to do this. Do you, know, you want to make it inactive, or, or just delete it, or do, you want, or do I want it to kind of keep keeping it around? So for example, if there was some kind of problem now with my scaling, I could actually go back to my previous version. But the most common thing that you would do is actually when you deploy a new version of your application, it will actually create you know, a new revision. And so just to show you that, uh, so actually it was kind of funny because usually you don't see the, the inactive. So it wasn't actually deactivated yet. Now it's inactive. And by default here, you will only see the active ones. Um, but we could also, if we go back here and do an AC container app revision. Actually, I do I think have and let's say container app demo. Here we should see that we have uh, two revisions. And let me zoom in a little bit. So two revisions. Uh, the the last the second one is the one that is active, and you can now see like the, the difference here. So the first one uh, was going uh, now has zero replicas and zero traffic weight, but the new one now has uh, three replicas, which was the minimum. Uh, that are specified in scaling. So you can see the, the difference there. But you can see that the old one is still around, and I could actually now, if I wanted to, kind of uh, revert that one or kind of go back to that version. So I have um, the second part of the demo will be another application, but I'm just going to do a sneak peek into that one to show you uh, the traffic splitting. So um, let's go to the the container app. Uh, so in this environment, I have three container apps. So I have a web application, a backend API, and the processor that runs in the background. So let's take a look at the, the, the web application, and let's go to the revision, revision management. 
So I, I have run. I have a pipeline that, that deploys this. I run this twice. So that's why I have two versions. And again, I have uh, uh, all the traffic sent to the latest one, uh, which means that if I go to let's uh, grab the URL from here and open it up. Uh, it looks like this. So this is the, the web front end. It just uh, asks the API for some orders and so on. Um, so it's running there. And I also show uh, the version up there uh, of this particular application. So it's 2.0.72. So if I go back now to the revision, um, what I can do here now is say, I, actually, I want to have like 50% of the traffic sent to the new one, but 50% of the traffic sent to the old one. So this is just uh, now I'm just changing the the ingress or actually how the traffic is routed. That's not a revision scope change, so it won't create new revision. Um, so I will still have two revisions, but now if I go back here, uh, it should kind of uh, flip uh, back and forth uh, on the version here. So now it says uh, 70, 71, and if I refresh, you know, go back, it's, it's probably going to say seventy two eventually, depending on how it's routed. So now it's basically going to send like 50% of the traffic to the first, to the new one, and 50% to, to the old one. So this is a way, you know, you can use this in many ways, of course. You can do things like A-B testing, you can do canary deployments, and so on. Um, in addition to that, you can also use labels. Uh, so labels is a more static way of actually uh, talking to a particular revision. So this is, you would use labels very similar to the way you use deployment slots in an Azure App Service. You can have one label called latest and one label called staging, for example. Uh, and every time you deploy a new revision, you would just uh, ch change that label, right? And then the traffic will be routed to, to the new one. So you do that typically from a pipeline, then deploy version, change the label, uh, and you're good to go. So in that way, you can deploy a staging version, try it out, do smoke tests, and so on. And then you do the last swap and move the label for the latest to that version. So a lot of flexibility here, but without the complexity of setting up things like Envoy, uh, uh, and those kind of things that you would have to do if you if you did this kind of in, in, in Kubernetes. All right, so let's go back to the slides um, and talk about scaling. And now I, I just did a, a manual scale. I just scale up manually, uh, as you saw before. Uh, but of course, um, container apps support uh, automatic scaling using various various types of triggers. Um, so it supports uh, HTTP or TCP triggers, which basically is if I get a lot of traffic to my API or web, I can scale out based on those number of requests. It supports event-driven scaling, so based on things like uh, queues, event hubs, Redis, and so on. Uh, it will actually read metrics from that service, for example, a, a service bus or a storage queue, and see that, okay, if we have more than a certain number of messages, I want you to scale out. Uh, and also, you can use uh, CPU memory for uh, for resource-intensive applications, so typically uh, background processing jobs, uh, those kind of things. And it uses, uh, again, as I mentioned before, the open source project called the CADA, so which stands for Kubernetes Event-Driven Autoscaling. Um, and uh, this is an example how you would configure this in Bicep uh, for do HTTP traffic scaling. So I'm specifying that I want to have the, the min and max. I want to go from zero replicas up to a maximum of 10 replicas. So a replica is an instance uh, in Kubernetes language. So I want to scale between zero and 10. And I'm using the HTTP autoscale uh, function. And I'm specifying, in this case, concurrent request 50. So basically, it says that if you have more than 50 uh, requests or concurrent requests, I want you to scale up. Uh, and then you know, if you go down below 50, it will scale down after a certain period of time. So right now, these like the, the polling intervals are like fixed. I don't think you can change it yet. That will probably be, be possible soon. So like the, I think the polling now is like every 30 seconds, it's going to decide if it, if it should scale up or scale down or scale up, sorry. And then it's uh, 300 seconds before it's scaled down uh, because you don't want to scale up and down too fast because that could be really <laughs> weird behavior sometimes. So if you scale up, you want to make sure that you actually are on that level for a while before you uh, scale down. Because you know the number of requests isn't typically super fluid; it can actually be like this. So you have to have some kind of uh, uh, sliding window thing here. But uh, probably, in, in if you do Kubernetes, you have much more control over exactly how this works. And I suspect that it will be, you know, gradually they will be adding more options here. 
So event-driven scaling can look like this. In this case, I'm uh, scaling based on, uh, on the Azure service bus. So depending on what type of scaler you have here, uh, you will have different properties here. Uh, in this case, I'm specifying the name of my service bus topic and the name of the subscription. And then I have the queue length here, which I specify as 20. So again, that means that if I have more than 20 messages on, the, on that service bus waiting for to be consumed, then it will scale up to a maximum of 10 instances. Uh, but I want you to kind of uh, think about that it actually says zero on, on the minimum replicas. And this, that, that's actually a key part here, it's, it's, it's particularly if you're talking, uh, thinking about this pay for what you use here. Because this means you can actually scale down your application to zero instances uh, and you don't pay anything. But as soon as, uh, for example, a message comes in or a request is done to API, it will scale up. Uh, if you have zero instances, that scaling up will be a, a bit slower, of course, because it's not running. So if you want to have something that is quick to actually always run, you, you probably want to have the minimum replicas to at least one. So you pay a little bit more, uh, but you know. Uh, but for some cases, it makes a lot of sense. It doesn't really matter if the first one maybe is a little bit slow to start. Uh, once it's it's up and running, it will scale up pretty fast. So uh, again, you can you can really build uh, money money efficient software here if you do these things uh, right. So again, I, I'm talking about Kayla here, and 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 uh, I used to do a presentation about Kayla, so I have some slides here, but really. Container apps uses Kada, and you don't really have to know about it. Uh, it just uh, uh, empowers the, the, the features used in Kada. So Kada has all of these options, uh, and, and it works in a specific way, and it has support for a lot of these things. And you get the support through container apps without having to install it, without having to know how it works. It just works. Uh, so that's what I want to kind of uh, for you to, to take away here that it uses this. It's open source, so like when they get a new version of Kada, they will eventually be part of the container apps service as well. And it's just a, a nice thing to do. Same thing about the Dapper then. So I won't talk too much about Dapper. And for you, if you're here tomorrow, there will be a separate session on Dapper. But Dapper is another open source project, uh, which is really about making it a lot easier for you to build uh, distributed applications. Uh, and without a lot of plumbing code and without you know repeating a lot of things that that's common like service discovery like security like uh, storage secrets those kind of things so it just cons consists of a, a various number of building blocks uh, um, that you can use and all of these are optional uh, has anybody used dapper it's quite still quite new i would say but just a few people uh, so I, I really urge you to look into it uh, and, and again, if you come here tomorrow, you'll see more about it. Uh, but in the context then of container apps is that you can enable Dapper. And uh, Dapper works uh, using what's called a, a sidecar pattern, really, which means that uh, if you enable Dapper um, and you have multiple services and you want to talk between those services, you will actually not talk uh, directly to them. You will actually talk uh, through these Dapper sidecars. And that happens automatically. You don't really have to kind of care about it, but you, you can use the Adapter SDK to make this super simple. So you can just say, I want to talk to my, my second API here just based on some name, and Dapper will handle that for you. Uh, and you can use Dapper not just in container apps. You can run it locally. You can run it really anywhere. So if you have Dapper, it makes it really easy to run these applications locally, and then you just deploy it to container apps or to Kubernetes, and it will work exactly the same way. You don't even have to make any configuration changes. Uh, because Dapper will resolve uh, the services uh, for you. It does a lot of other things as well, uh, so I won't go into that right now. Um, but again, open source project, it's, it's quite uh, active. A lot of things happening there. So more and more support for various providers there. Uh, and it's, it's part of container apps, which is nice. So, so the other demo I will do is... Uh, uh, what I talked about before, I have this application with three parts, uh, the web, the API, and then I have a background order processing that will kind of consume messages. So how this actually works is uh, when I create a new order, it will call the API. The API will actually send a message to the service bus, and then it will be consumed by the, the, the processing uh, background service. It will store its data to Cosmos. Um, and then I'm going to try to scale this one based on the number of messages. So hopefully I can do that using a super simple load test, uh, but uh, we'll see. Sometimes the network isn't with you, right? So, 
Let's go to, let's actually could just run the application first locally. So uh, I have a link to the repository, by the way, at the end of the, of the session. So you can look at all of the, the code that I'm showing you and, and more. So um, I have my three application here, the, the API, the processor, and the web. And so I'm just going to start by running it. Um, and I'm using Dapper for this particular product then. Um, so, and, and there's some VS Code will actually help you just cr create the correct configuration to, to have these sidecars running locally. So now the application is running uh, locally. I'm actually using the, the same Cosmos storage that uh, the, the deployed version is using. So I'm getting the same data. If we go back to VS Code here, um, there's actually, if you install the extension, it will help you with various things. But here we can actually see that we have three Dapper application running. I have the API, I have the processor and, and the web. And uh, so Dapper uses this concept of components to make it uh, easier, for example, to talk to things like uh, service bus, to talk to things like state stores. Uh, and again, uh, Alex will probably cover this much in much more detail tomorrow. But I think that the important thing is like uh, when I have this set up, uh, I can just I run the application. Uh, the the various services can talk to each other. So, for example, if I just look at the, my web application to to see how I actually call the API, I'm just gonna, I'm just going to show you this part. And in this case, I'm using the .NET SDK. So there's SDKs for many languages. So I'm just creating a Dapper client. And then I'm saying, I want to call my order API and call the, the method called order on that API. Uh, and that's the only thing I need to specify. I don't need to specify where this service is running. Dapper will, will find that service for me, both if I run it locally and if I run it in container apps and if I run it in Kubernetes and so on. That's, that's really what makes it both like very portable and very like easy to use. And a lot of the plumbing code just goes away. And then there's uh, similar things for, for example, storing data. So just a quick peek on the, the thing that actually stores data. It's basically one line of code to store this uh, in a state store. So I'm just calling save state in, in the state store. And now we have a Dapper component that knows how, in this case, I want to store it in Cosmos DB, and then it would just store it for me. So it, it really makes me like, you know, more, more productive, uh, and I don't have to write a lot of plumbing code. So OK. Uh, that was the application, and uh, let's just stop it for now. And uh, I have a pipeline that uh, deploys this application using Bicep. So I thought we could look at the, the Bicep a little bit, how that looks. And uh, in my, I have various types of deployments here. So the folder is named ARM, but it's actually Bicep. Um, so. I have a like a the, the main file, the overall file that that uh, uh, kind of references my my different parts. And what's not, one thing that's nice about Bicep is that you can easily visualize it. So since this is kind of the start part here, you can click the little visualize here, and uh, you get a nice oops, nice little visualization here. So let's zoom in a little bit so we can actually see here. And do it like this. So, well, at least if you have nice eyes, you can see that uh, we here we have like the the environment that I specify, and here we have the three different applications. Uh, and you can see like the dependencies between them. It's uh, it's visualizing my dependencies in the in the bicep files. So, at the application, I have the environment. Inside the environment, I create the, the log analytics workspace. I create the application insights, the actual environment, and so on. Um, so. When I have this, it's very, very simple to actually deploy this. So if I just take a quick peek in, in my pipeline, the only thing I need to do now is actually to, to deploy it using, a, in this case, I'm using a simple PowerShell script, which just do one thing. It says AC deployment, group create, point it to the bicep file, send in some parameters. That's the only thing I need to do. Uh, and this will then create both my entire environment, if it's not already there, it will create the apps and, you know, since the apps point to container version, it will also you know, deploy my version. So I can just run this, uh, this uh, deployment over and over again for, with new versions, which will then update both my environment if something changes, but otherwise it will update my application. So the pipeline becomes uh, very, very simple in this case, uh, since I'm using Bicep. But you could do this uh, like using the Azure CLI only, if you wanted that. Um, but I, I kind of like using uh, Bicep 
um, or things like Terraform uh, when you do this in a, from a pipeline. So um, again, I have this running. Let's go back to the portal. Please, 50 minutes left. That's good. So um, uh, again, we have the order web here. And if we go back to, can actually go to the environment again, just to start fresh here. So here we have uh, the three different applications. Um, so the web, the API, and the, the processor. And if you go to the web, you will have the, the application URL here. So you can reach it like that. And again, of course, you can attach a, a custom domain and so on to it. Uh, but this is how you would access it then. And uh, let's let's uh, look at scaling then. So what I want to do now is, uh, uh, if I suddenly get a lot of orders being sent through the API and, and ends up on the service bus, uh, I would actually want to scale out that order processor. That's a background thing that runs and consumes messages from the service bus. Um, and uh, if we go to the order processor, this one, and we look at scale uh, down here. You can see that uh, we have one scale rule here, uh, which is just called Q-based autoscaling. And if we click this one, uh, we can see some details here, which says that it's... Uh, 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 so this is now a, a service bus scaler, and uh, I pointed to the, the topic name, the subscription, the things I showed you before from the bicep. And in this case, I have a queue length of one, which means that if I get more than one message on my queue, I want you to scale out. So that's quite a low number, but it makes it a little bit easier to kind of show this in, in a demo uh, scenario. Um, but otherwise, it's, uh, as you can see here, the, the min and max replicas is zero to 10 which means that currently we don't have any revision uh, at all running. Uh, and to show you what that actually means that, let's go to the metrics for this one and see the number of replicas here over time. So this is the last 24 hours, the number of replicas. I tried this yesterday and it worked. So in case it doesn't work now, I can go back to this metric and show you the graph, right? And you will still be impressed. Uh, but the, then uh, this morning when I sat there, I actually, created uh, these orders because I had a, an uh, empty Cosmos storage. So I went through like just the site and created orders, uh, but I had like zero replicas running. So the first one took a little while to actually uh, being processed. Uh, and you can kind of see this here in this spike here. So around uh, nine, you can see that it scaled up from zero to one. Um, and then typically, I think if we zoom in, we can probably see that this should be around five minutes, so this is 8.57, and then this is 9.02, which makes sense because that's the default setting for, for container apps to scale down, that's the 300 seconds. So going from zero to one is a, is a little bit slower. So in case I, I want to have like immediate response there, I will probably have the minimum replicas to at least one. But now I had zero, which means that I don't pay anything for this processor until it's actually uh, a message is sent to that queue, right? But let's see if the autoscaling works. Uh, so now we have zero replicas. And uh, to do that, I'm, I have uh, just an application that will send a lot of messages. Uh, I also have a little, a little, little thing like this that actually shows me the, the queue length. Yeah, I know, it's beautiful. And uh, well, let's do like this. Try, I'm gonna try to make this super interesting for you. Um, so that's the queue length, so there's no messages coming through right now. And uh, so I'm going to run this uh, the application that I wrote, and I'm actually going to run it using Dapper. Uh, so I, don't, I won't mention it too much, but again, Dapper makes it very, very simple to talk to, to various services, including the service bus. So I'm actually running it using Dapper. And for the details, go to Alex session tomorrow. This is just a way for me to run it. So let's uh, run this, and it's going to start sending messages to my service bus. And so you can see that it actually increases now quite uh, fast, uh, the queue length here. So what should happen now is that my queue processor should wake up now, uh, start processing messages, and hopefully it should scale up to uh, 10 instances. So this should now hopefully go down. Uh, but the first one is, uh, the, the polling is around 30, oh, there we go. 
and it goes down and i think eventually it's going to find like a little <laughs> stable zone there uh because I'm, i think i'm sending like a thousand messages uh but you can see like the, the effect here like i didn't have any instances i start to send messages after a while it scales up up to 10 instances i can consume those messages fast uh, and then when i stop sending messages here just you can leave it here uh, then of course it's going to process everything uh, it's still going to be 10 replicas for uh, up to five minutes and then it's going to scale down automatically and again then you don't have to pay for it so we should be able to see this here but this one i think updates every minute but if we're lucky we can probably see let's look at the last 30 minutes and uh, well in a few seconds, ah, oh, there we go. So you can see now that it actually scale up. You can see the replica count here going up to eight and it will eventually go up to, to 10 there uh, and stay there. Okay, so, so the question is, can you, can you have more complex scaling rules? than, for example, this one. And uh, currently, you, you can't do that. Uh, again, the scaling is, is based on, on Keda. So you just want to go to keda.sh. So this is right. All the documentation for, for how you can scale is actually available here as well. So for each of these uh, type of services, you can find like how you actually configure it using Keda. So if you look at the service bus, uh, is it Azure service bus here? Uh, again, you can see the, the the configuration here, and also like the the various options that you have. Um, but it's more it's, it's kind of based on this uh, threshold thing. Uh, so if if you're above above a certain threshold, you will scale up, uh, and then it will scale down when the, when the load decreases. Uh, so you, currently, you can't do that as far as I know, but that might very well be a, a case that it actually comes to Keda. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, uh, not through the scaler itself, but then you will typically just have a pipeline or something that will that will configure the scaler for you. Yeah. So the thing I configured in my bicep, I can just uh, schedule my pipeline and do that for me. So the scaler itself doesn't support that, but it's very easy for you to, to do that yourself. Uh, I was going to show you something, but I actually kind of forgot what it was when I got the questions. <laughs> uh, what were we doing? Yeah, so more questions. No, no, more questions. Ah, oh, never mind. I think I showed you what I what I wanted to show you. Um, so yeah, that was actually my last demo. And uh, let's have just one final slide. And that is pricing, the most fun part. Um, so I, I think I, I took the, the most uh, recent one. So how you pay for these things is you pay for uh, in one part, the number of requests coming in, and then you pay for you pay here fifty six cent for every million requests, and you get two million requests for free. This is fun, actually. I mean, you always have this uh, like you get free requests, and you're like, wow, that's really generous, right? Two million requests. That's a, that's a, like a nice, right? Uh, but like if you calculate it, so two million requests, how much does that cost? It's like one dollar. I just think it's fun, but it's nice. You can try it out and for cheap things, you don't have to pay at all really. So you pay for the number of requests and then you pay for the, for the resource consumptions, which is based on the amount of CPU and, and memory that you're using. Uh, and they actually then, in addition, you have like this free grant, but then you, you're paying for a certain number of <laughs> millicents per second. Uh, as you can see down here, they actually have two different ways here of uh, Specifying the price, you have the active usage price and you have idle usage price. Uh, that actually means that if you have, for example, uh, let's say, let's say an order processor or an API. So let's say you have an API and you want to be able to scale up, but you don't want to have that slow initial start. So you, you're specifying you want to have one replica running, but if that replica does, doesn't get any requests, you actually only pay the idle usage price, right? Which is uh, a lot cheaper so you can actually have one instance going which will give you faster scaling when needed but you don't have to pay for that like you don't have to pay the full amount for that instance because it's not, not doing anything 
So that's why they have this, this idle usage price, which makes it even more interesting. So in many cases, it can actually be a, a wise choice to just have one replica. It will scale faster and you will still pay very little money for it. And you can have like three replicas and they will pay three times this amount. Yeah. So, uh, so it's a bit different like compared to other services in Azure. Uh, so it's really like pay for what you use and trying to kind of find your scenario spot here. Your, your, your best way of, of using this thing can like really, really uh, efficient with the, with the money usage. So that was actually it. Uh, and uh, here's the link to my uh, GitHub account for uh, where all the source code and the bicep file and the pipelines, everything is available there. Uh, and uh, I'll stick around for questions during lunch. And uh, does anyone have more questions right now? Otherwise, we can just do it afterwards. And uh, otherwise, I'll just say thanks and have a nice lunch now. <laughs>